thank you all for uh, giving those uh, presentations. And if you guys have uh, uh, questions, uh, otherwise I have always a lot of questions, as you know. Uh, does anyone have questions? Maybe I'll... Uh... Yes, here we go. So can we have a microphone here? It's OK, we have time. Don't fall. <laughs> and sorry about your... Right here, number six, please. Uh, thank you. Um, well, I was wondering, because I'm familiar with doing mindfulness meditation, but um, you told us about uh, um, the compassion and, uh, and, and theory of mind training you can do. And I was wondering, how do you start? Like, what are the resources uh, to get started with this kind of training? Uh, whether there are already resources online. What do you recommend? <laughs> so, uh, so at the moment, we, we recommend that you basically start doing it with a teacher first before you use apps because it's always very helpful to know about how to really do the exercise right. So, for example, these dietic exercise, we, this is why we start with retreats, so that you can learn that this is not just a chit-chat as we are used to it, but that it is really like a zen-like meditation exercise where the person who is listening is really giving you this present space, you know, the mindfulness space and of empathic listening and not even nodding with the, you know, what we would usually do, like what we do now, is, you know, like giving signs of of nodding and you know like you are white but in this meditation you really give the space to the other and you just listen and you you do a vipassana on what you are feeling while you are listening to another person and the other person is talking about what's going on what was difficult in the last 24 hours how did it felt and for what were you thankful and so while the other person is talking about this emotion and getting conscious about it the other person is just listening very present and not interrupting at all. And so, you know, you, you, with such a diet, with such an exercise, you learn two things. The person who speaks learns to become conscious of its emotions and how to develop gratitude and thankfulness every day. The person who listens get conscious about what listening really means. And we, we can do this diet then over app, but they are not free now because <laughs> what we think is that it's always better to have a teacher first before you go on your apps. Thank you, Tanya. I have a feeling I have to actually interrupt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yes. Who, who meditates in the room already? Just, uh, okay, well, not that many. Who, who intends after these three talks to try? <laughs> ah, looks like you did a good job. <laughs> Good afternoon, Camilo from the Agence du Numérique in Belgium. Thanks to your great talk, we have understood that we are nowadays in a position where we can start to read the brain. My question is the following. Do you think that as of tomorrow, we start to be able to write in the brain? I'm just thinking, though, about Inceptions, you know, the famous movie from Leonardo DiCaprio. Who wants to take this? <laughs> Go ahead. I think this is Christopher's question. <laughs> so um, I do think that one of the most exciting things that's coming through neuroscience into the coming decade and decades is the ability to write information into the brain in a whole series of ways. The way that people most directly think of writing information into the brain, which seems sort of like science fiction, like the matrix, is using technology. So there's new technologies like functional ultrasound, for example, which uses sound waves to be able to directly activate uh, regions of the brain, we hope even deep within the brain safely, and write information in that way, write patterns of activation. The effects of even rather simple and crude stimulation in the brain can be profound. So if you take one or two wires and implant them into the brain in the right, exactly right place, like a pacemaker for the brain, you can have dramatic impacts on patients where it's successful with movement disorders. You can turn someone who has incredible tremor, making their life almost impossible, into someone who is largely healthy. So the ability to change the functioning of the brain with technology, I think, has profound implications for what we're going to be able to do. As I was saying in my talk, if you can turn on different brain systems, it's hard to imagine what you cannot accomplish. And I think another avenue to do this that we're primarily focused on is not about using technology 
to stimulate the brain. Because I think there's a real question about the safety of this and whether you would really want your brain stimulated by technology or whether you want to write information to your brain yourself by taking control yourself of different processes within it, learning how to produce change, how to take on a capability from another person. And I think where we're ultimately heading is using technology to be able to share capabilities across the species. So if you imagine the greatest master at any particular skill, whether this is Michael Jordan stuffing a basketball, or Albert Einstein in his brilliance, or Gandhi in his compassion, I think we are moving in the direction of technology, allowing us to share capabilities. Imagine if we had one more Gandhi in this room. I think that's something that is going to happen and that technology is getting us there. And I, would just add, I, I would just add that I think we can add uh, efficiency to that equation by studying uh, things like mindfulness so that you can learn to get out of your own way much more quickly so that when there is something that's, oh, this is a, a very efficient way to learn something, we're not putting the brakes on it saying, oh, I, I think it should be this way, or I think it should be this way. We're just completely getting out of the way so our brains can actually learn because they're very good at doing this. We just have to let them do it. Another question? Yes, over here. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the three of you for the amazing possibilities you've shown us as to the future of the mind. However, one question pops out, um, at least to me. Do you think, does each of you think there are risks to the possibilities that we're discussing? And if so, which? Thank you. That's a great question. It is. Who wants to start? Ladies first, Justin. <laughs> so I think the risk, which I think I alluded a little bit, is on one hand, I'm super happy that mindfulness got kind of in the salons of, you know, business world and all that. But I think there is a bit of a risk that at the moment, mindfulness is sold like a product where you have a breathing app without any teacher and in two minutes you get enlightened or you get, you know, and uh, I, I hope that I could show you at least some data. You don't like that? No, those, those it's a risk. I like think headspace and those. I like that, but I think it needs to be embedded in real teaching, and it needs to be embedded in the depths of teaching. Otherwise what? What's the risk? With, because, um, you know, transforming your mind is not... It's a bit like you go into... Uh, high sophisticated gym, you never get introduced into the, the machines which are there, and you start training your muscle in a way which is actually... Oh, so you get one like this and... Or you, you kind of break your neck you break because your neck. you do this much too, you know, and nobody has actually taught you how, you know, what, you know, why you do this. And the, the other risk I see is that mindfulness, which was developed in contemplative tradition, is something very ethical. It was all about compassion. It was all about relieving suffering in the world. It was not about me optimizing my concentration. This was a mean to the end. This was meant to be the basis for what you then can you know, cultivate compassion and a focus on the other. Thank you. And I think this is really important that this doesn't get lost, that, you know, this kind of compassionate quality of ethics and care in which it originated gets teached as well. Yeah, I agree. I think having access to a teacher or facilitator is really important. That's one reason we had set up our online community so people can actually have the access. Yes. The, another thing that I would add is that when you start to go through this journey of seeing reality a little more clearly, you run into all sorts of stuff that you did not anticipate. <laughs> and it can be really scary. It can be to the point of terrifying. And um, in many spiritual traditions, these journeys are described as things like the dark night of the soul. That's a little different than this is flowers and champagne. And so having a guide along the way can be really, really helpful. Like, so having a teacher or somebody that can help point out these milestones to help people see them as milestones rather than you know, feeling like their entire world is you know, crazy and them getting you know, admitted to a psychiatric hospital, is those two, two are very different. So I think that's one of the risks. If, if somebody doesn't have a guide along the way or some signposts, they can get into territory that seems terrible for them, when in fact that can just be, oh, look, you're, that's good progress, keep going. So that's another risk that I would add. 
So I think it's a very important question. I think the issue of neuroethics is going to be a more and more important one as our technologies enable us to do things that we can't even imagine today. I'll give you some examples. I can envision a day in the near future where we will be able to read information out of people's brains. We've done this in our own laboratory, and we can tell increasingly accurately whether someone is telling the truth or not. That's going to have profound societal implications. The technology isn't there yet, but I think that we're going to be there in a relatively short space of time. What does this mean ethically? What is it going to mean for our culture? We've seen privacy change through the internet. What is it going to mean when privacy, the border of your own privacy, goes all the way into your own mind? One of the things that I think is really interesting about it is that it's going to be retroactive. And here's what I mean. Believe with me, if you will, that at some point in the future, in five years or 10 years or 20 years, there's going to be a lie detector that actually works. If that's true, I think it's hard to imagine that the truth and information there isn't going to be used. I think the internet has taught us that information can't stay secret. And it will become, in my opinion, societally acceptable and normal to use this technology. Here's how it's retroactive. Imagine that we form a relationship today, and we say something to one another in this beginning relationship, whether it's starting a new company or any other kind of relationship. And 20 years from now, this, ex this scanner exists. So I say to you, Will you get in the scanner and just answer for me one question, only one? Have you ever lied to me? If the answer is no, I'm glad I, I always trusted you. If the answer is yes, that can come all the way back to today. I think this gives us an opportunity, and I'd invite everyone to think about our own personal transparency and our own personal integrity in a new way, and to allow the truthfulness between people to blossom, because I think this is going to transform our culture. Uh, can we access, you think at one point we'll be access, able to read the memories? You're saying read if I'm saying the truth or not, but how about memories? Can, can you scan my brain and access uh, what's in it? So we're already doing that in crude ways. You know, we don't today have the capability to read out dense information from someone's memory. It's hard to predict when that kind of technology will be available, you know, the sort of matrix idea of reading a memory. Downloading it? Yeah, but I think what's going to happen first and what is happening even in our laboratory and many other laboratories is we're reading the crucial variables out of someone's memory. In the lie detection case, which is not uh, accurate today, but we're heading in that direction. Do you remember seeing this scene where a crime may have been committed? Yes or no? Do you remember it? Do you have a strong psychological reaction which we can measure when you see it? Simple measures, yes, no answers, can give transformative information in many cases. In the case we're working on, if you can tell whether someone is in chronic pain or not, it can be transformative. There's no existing test, prior test, to tell the difference between a person who is in no pain and a person who needs the strongest medication. So we are already reading the, 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 the information out of consciousness, and I think, like the early phonograph record, it's only going to have higher and higher fidelity as the technology improves. Tanya, you disagree, apparently? Strongly, uh, less, I No, less optimistic. <laughs> I think we can't, I mean, we have decoding, devices in your science, but they are super crude. So we don't, we can't say, you know, you were now thinking about your mother which, and the cake you will, she will bake you this evening and, you know, like all these kind of fine, we are very far away from it. And I but how think, about in 10 years? So Ray, Ray, Ray Kurzweil is, because he's announcing this, mm -hmm. I think he's saying by, by what, they, what year that we'll be able to download our brains. Like you stick a USB stick in there. <laughs> 
No, I mean, at the moment, we are very cool. Yes, far. Yeah, yeah. I want to be modest here. So that's not coming, Jutsun? In 10 years, I could see it. I In 10 years, you can years. see it? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> We're moving pretty fast. And so I, we'll see it. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> so, so my opinion is that it's not a binary thing of what year we'll be able to do it. It's a question of how well we'll be able to do it. We can do it in our lab today, but as you say, it's still crude. The question is, with what fidelity do you want to be able to do it? And you know, I showed already some movies about reconstructing visual experience from people's brains. They're, they're still relatively crude, but I think quite impressive. And so I think the issue is, um, like with artificial intelligence, you know, they used to say, well, uh, human will never, a machine will never beat someone at chess. And then they did, and they said, oh, well, chess is just a game. And there's been a progression of artificial intelligence moving forward. There's not a point where you can say, when is a machine smarter than a person? It's more like individual domains. And I think that's how it's going to unfold. We're going to be able to read out particular types of information that are easier and that are particularly important so people focus on them. And over time, the numbers and kinds that we're able to read out will grow. Is there any way I really enjoyed with Tim Berners-Lee the conversation this morning? was a little scary at one point where if you start to imagine machines just getting that data, and is there any way you can project yourself and see actually a machine thinking as close as possible to how we think, or, or like turning? We're, we're taking selfies, right? Can you like reconstruct yourself in, in a computer? And when you die, it's OK. It keeps going. Is that coming? Kurzweil thinks so, you know, this, this singularity concept. Um, Evolution has an interesting path, and it seems to be able to be taking its own path. And right now, there's a lot moving in that direction. You know, there's there's been a lot of warning about that. I think um, Stephen Hawking just put out a pretty strong warning about it. we have to be very careful about just this. last week. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But in a way, the session we had to now it was all about phenomenological experience of when you start meditate, for example, it's exactly the reverse in a way, because what you are doing is to really go in depth into the wonderfulness of our human ability not to be a robot, but to have a phenomenological experience of consciousness. Yes. And this is what we do in meditation, is instead of objectivizing something, is to become masters, you could say, in describing different internal states. Uh, which are really inside of your experiential experience when you sit. So instead of focusing on external, you're focusing on this incredible mental life you have inside. And then you get more and more refined in describing these different states. And that, a robot, I mean, you know, the, the experience of love, the experience of wetness, the experience of light will never be replaced by some object or robots or so. This is a phenomenological experience you have through your first-person subjective experience. Right. And that's what meditation is all about. I was thinking it would be hard. It's going to be, we're st always going to need to be able to describe our experience and know our experience before anything like that can be translated to any, any, any machine. That would mean by guess. So we're, we're going to need that edge. <laughs> any other question? Or was I? I just have a few. No? Well, just raise your hand if you have one. Um, what happens in your, uh, in, in your brain when you, when I did the 10-day retreat, I had the worst nightmares and the uh, best dreams. It becomes very, very vivid. It's like uh, pretty amazing what, what happens to the brain when you quiet it down. That's my experience. What, what happens? Why is it doing this when you start meditating like a few hours every day? Well, so Loic, let me ask you a question. So I remember when you were planning on going on a long silent retreat, and like many people, you were wondering what it was going to be like and having some concern about you know, 10 days in silence. And we talked about what was going to be the experience after. I think in many ways, the most important question really, especially for people who may be thinking about doing this, is you've become very dedicated to this. I've seen your practice on a daily basis. What have you experienced? What have you changed? What has changed in your life? And one of the things that I think is really important to ask is there are many different kinds of meditation, many different kinds of ways to control the brain, technologies for cognition. 
what have you found that you can do now that you didn't used to be able to do? What have you installed in your brain through this process that you didn't used to have? Um, I've not prepared this. I don't have a talk. <laughs> but I'm planning to, to, to do a talk like this. Uh, one is focus. So if I'm talking to you, I'm much more present than I used to be. I have much less uh, multitasking happening. That's one. Uh, the second one is um, I feel that there is a filter that I've built, which is like a muscle that I'm exercising. Correct me if I'm wrong, but these are just feelings. No science here. But so I don't get, ask my team actually. The web a few years ago, I was getting upset all the time. When, so your microphone, you know, I, I would be like, you know, and now I, I just, you know, we find your microphone. It's okay, we survived. It's, it's, there is a filter between the, the stimuli and the reaction. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like I was much more animal before, if I, if I may. I was like, you give me pain or you insult me and I'm French from south of France, I'm going to jump back on you immediately. If you give me a finger as I drive, I'll be very upset, right? I was like this and uh, the last nine months I've never been upset. Very, very rarely. Uh, so, so there's a filter happening. I feel that uh, pretty much all the time, except if I drink too much wine, <laughs> <laughs> that uh, I can see it coming and I don't do it. Because I uh, understood from Vipassana that it, 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 it's bad for you, you don't, if you don't do it. And I would say the third one is um, new ideas. And I was telling this to Judson. Uh, if you guys have seen the Fred Wilson conversation, we had this uh, breakfast setting. And I uh, meditated a full hour the day before, as I do, <laughs> the day before the opening of the web. And I, I kept, you know, I, you're not trying to not think. You, keep, you let the ideas come in and come out, right? And one idea came in of me having breakfast with Fred on stage. Uh, and I tried to not crave. I tried to be like, oh, that would be cool. <laughs> Croissant. And, you know. <laughs> And I let it go, and then I forgot about it. Then I met my team here, of course, who loved it. A few hours before, I said, like, how about we do this? And they, they added the table. I think I would not have had that idea. That's, that's what it did to me, which I, I have new ideas. I'm much more creative, I think, but quieter for sure. Does this answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, I think you're describing really nice this, this idea that simply seeing how crazy our minds are and not picking, you know, not running after any of these ideas, the good ideas, they'll come up time after time and they say, oh, you should actually pay attention to this one when the right time comes, so after you finish sitting or whatever. And I think this is a beautiful example of how we start to train our minds and we stop listening to these committee members, you know, that are like screaming. So you were asking the question, you're like, why are our minds crazy when we start to sit on meditation retreats? Well. Suddenly, our mind is so used to us listening to it, you know, like everything it says, it's like we're at its beck and call. But we sit there and we're like, yeah, whatever, whatever, whatever. And then it says, no, you really have to listen to me. So it starts coming up with all sorts of elaborate things, you know, so you start imagining, you know, sex and you start, it's, it's going to do whatever it can Never. to get, <laughs> it's going to do whatever it can to get your attention. And when it sees that you're really not going to bite, you know, when you're not going to follow it, then it starts to settle down. And now you've got a well-trained mind. Yeah. Well, a beginning, I, I don't know. And they, I think, think there's also a counterintuitive effect when you are absolute beginner. Very often I have heard participants saying, oh, you know, actually I'm not thinking a lot. You know, there are 80% of my day I'm not really thinking. So why should I observe my thinking? Will I not, you know, like basically just have nothing? And then, you know, like teachers say, oh, you know, just start. And, and then only when you really start looking at what your brain is chattering, and then there's this effect after three weeks when they really start practicing, they say, it's so loud. You yep. know, it's unbearable. It's so loud. It's like the radio is because it's the first time you get aware how much you are thinking all your life. You know what I'd like? And I, <laughs> I posted it on, uh, this on Facebook, if any developer here wants, wants to play, I, I'll be happy to be a, a sample uh, a tester. It's, I would love an app that I, when I meditate and I have an idea, which is all the time, you can't stop this, right? People think you can, but you can't. Even, even monks with 10,000 of hours have ideas. And, and I just say the idea. I keep my eyes closed and I say, breakfast on stage. And there is a Google voice, a voice recognition that just grabs it 
and then records all my ideas. After an hour, I get all my ideas, and then I get a, one of those clouds, right? With all those ideas. And then, every day, it records all those ideas, and I can see patterns, right? So, you know, you think about this, and you think about, you know, and, and then the top 10 tasks I'm thinking about, and, you know, that would be so cool. Just, it's a kind of a map of a brain that would result from it. Anyone? Well, <laughs> I have to say, I was on a month-long meditation retreat, and I was doing a lot of sitting meditation and a lot of ideas that kept saying, this is a really good idea. And so I would start writing them down and writing them down. And I realized none of these were any good. And so they're seductive. So with an app like that, we would need some, maybe if, it, if a thought comes up three or four times, then it says, OK, record that one. But otherwise, we run into the danger of, like, boy, I've got a lot of great ideas, which I thought that I did, and none of them were any good. Right. <laughs> I have also a story on that. When I meditated in the first retreat, I came to the teacher, you know, in the one-to-one -one mapping and said, you know, it's so great. I have so much good scientific ideas. And she was like, oh, my God, go back to your cushion. It's not about <laughs> generating goals, good ideas. You know, it's really about letting it go. And so I was like, OK, OK. I will have to let go. Uh, Tanya, Judson, uh, Christopher, you came from Germany, from California, all the way to uh, Charvis. This was really amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you for Thank having me. Thank you very much.